Mr. Hardy, um, over the lunch break, did you discuss the substance of your testimony with anybody from Invenergy, including but not limited to lawyers? I did not. Thank you. Uh, I'm still looking at your pre-filed direct testimony of June 30th, 2017. Uh, and I'm looking uh, at the bottom of page 32. Okay. Uh, the question uh, on line 20 is, are there other aspects of the Public Utilities Commission opinion that further confirm the need for CREC? And your answer starting on line 22 is yes. The PUC highlighted a few of the key reasons why CREC is needed. At the most basic level, the PUC agrees, page 8, that, quote, because CREC Unit 1 cleared the forward capacity auction 10, in accordance with the wholesale market rules and has a capacity supply obligation, continuing at the top of page 33, CREC Unit 1 is needed for system reliability. Is that correct? Yes. And uh, sitting here today, CREC Unit 1 does not have a capacity supply <coughs> obligation. Is that correct? <coughs> and sitting here today, the EFSB has rejected the PUC advisory opinion. Is that correct? That's correct. Page 34. Uh, on line uh, 5, there's a new section heading, section 4. Uh, responses to Town of Boroughville's witness, Glenn Walker. Question at line seven is, have you reviewed the testimony of the Town of Boroughville's witness, Glenn Walker? Your answer on line nine is yes. Question on line 10, do you disagree with his pre-file testimony? Your answer, starting on line 11, was yes. My greatest concern with Mr. Walker's pre-filed direct testimony is his incorrect and unsubstantiated statement that, quote, in light of recent developments, the September 12, 2016 advisory opinion from the Rhode Island PUC on these issues has been proven to be inaccurate, unquote. You see that? I do. And sitting here today, the EFSB has agreed with Mr. Walker and has rejected the PUC advisory. Is that I'll correct? object to the characterization that this board has determined that the opinion was inaccurate. That is not the reason it was rejected. It was rejected because it was stale. I'll, I'll reject to the form of the question. I'll withdraw the question and restate it. Sitting here today, the EFSB has rejected the PUC advisory opinion. Is that correct? That's correct. I'll object to that one as being asked and answered. We all know that the PUC opinion is, has been rejected. I don't know why. I'll let it stand for now. pre-filed rebuttal <coughs> testimony dated September 1st, 2017. Okay. Looking at page 3, the section starting <coughs> on line 18, you say, and I'm starting midway on line 18, resources that have cleared an auction and have a CSO are part of the package of resources needed for reliability within ISO New England and that this package cannot be broken apart. CREX Unit 1 has cleared an FCA 
and has a seven year capacity obligation. We'll pause for a moment. We've already discussed that that is not a seven year capacity obligation, but a seven year price lock in. Is that correct? That's the way that you have determined, that's the way that you have characterized it. I would characterize it as a seven year obligation because unless and until the ISO terminates that obligation, that obligation exists for seven years. So at the time that CREC Unit 1 cleared FCA 10, it had a seven year obligation at that fixed price. Isn't it a fact that every resource on the ISO New England system is obligated to remain on that system until or unless it has a retirement or delist bid approved by the ISO and ultimately approved by FERC. That's correct. And that's not a seven-year commitment, is it? No, it's you could determine. You could say it's a commitment at will or an evergreen commitment. I, I don't know how you would determine it, but it's not a seven-year capacity obligation. It's not a commitment at will because resources are not free to withdraw from the ISO system at will, are they? No, there's a process that they need to go through to withdraw. And their withdrawal has to be approved by the ISO first, is that correct? That's correct. And then by FERC? That's correct. And is it fair to say that most of the resources on the ISO system today have been existing generators for seven or more years? I, I don't know how you would define most. I mean, there is a significant amount of existing resources that have been on the, in the market for more than seven years. I would not characterize those plants as having seven-year capacity obligations as I would uh, constitute Clear River having a seven-year obligation or a plant like Footprint having a seven-year capacity obligation. I would treat those as separate and distinct. Okay, so just to be clear, your testimony is that it's your expert opinion that when a capacity resource clears a forward capacity auction and acquires a capacity supply obligation, <laughs> It acquires, in the words that you have here on lines 20 and 21, quote, a seven-year capacity obligation to meet electric reliability needs in New England, unquote. Is that your testimony? That's my testimony. Okay. Then we'll continue. In other words, according to the Connecticut Siting Council decision, CREC is part of the package of capacity necessary to meet New England and Rhode Island reliability needs. Is that correct? That's my testimony. And the uh, Connecticut Siting <coughs> Council decision that you were referring to here has to do with the uh, Killingly Energy Center, is that correct? That's correct. And the decision in that case by the Connecticut Siting Council was to deny a, a siting permit uh, to an applicant uh, that did not have a capacity supply obligation. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Would you say that, in other words, according to the Connecticut Siting Council decision, CREC today should not be granted a permit? No, I wouldn't say that. But you would say that when it had a capacity supply obligation, <coughs> you would apply the Killingly Energy Center Connecticut Siting Council decision to this case. Is that right? Not, not in, in terms of need. I, yes, I would say that having a CSO is certainly an element of need. But not having a CSO does not mean that a project is not needed. The inverse is not true. Okay. Let's turn to your November 20th, 2017 testimony. Mr. Hardy, why did you reference the Connecticut Siting Council decision? I, 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 sorry. 
Um, I referenced it because I, I think there was, um, in, in reviewing uh, Mr. Walker's testimony, he was making a point that, you know, in a given auction, if megawatts were procured above uh, the net ICR, and in the, in the case of FCA 10, it was procured over and above the, the, the net ICR. And I think his argument was, well, you could take Clear River's megawatts out of the supply stack, and there would still be sufficient capacity. Therefore, Clear River is not needed. And, and so the, the element of the Connecticut decision that I thought was relevant in this case is they said, when an auction clears, all of that capacity is deemed by the ISO to be needed. So you can't pick and choose projects or megawatts to pull out and then say, well, then we can still have a reliable market without it. It's, it's a complete package. So that is the, the uh, element of that decision. That <coughs> Thank you. Yeah. So Mr. Hardy, on page one of your November 20th testimony, you're asked at line nine, what is the purpose of your supplemental testimony? And your response is, the purpose of this supplemental testimony is to update the analysis provided to the board in my pre-filed direct and pre-filed rebuttal testimonies to include an update regarding ISO New England's determination that CREC, Unit 2, is not qualified to participate in the upcoming FCA 12. Is that correct? That's correct. And that was, in fact, the purpose of this supplemental testimony. Is that right? Yes. And on page 2, you're asked, on line 6, have you updated your analysis for this new information? And your answer is yes. I updated my analysis to assume that CREC Unit 2 participates in FCA 13 versus FCA 12. Is that right? <coughs> That's correct. And then uh, after the disqualification of Invenergy's two turbines uh, last September, from the upcoming FCA 13 that will happen next month, you filed in December of last year, just a few weeks ago, you filed additional testimony um, in, in which you said uh, that you thought that uh, Invenergy would clear in FCA 14, that is the forward capacity auction held by the ISO in February of 2020. Is that correct? That's correct. In that testimony, December 2018, were you predicting that CREC would clear FCA 14, or were you assuming that Invenergy would clear FCA 14? That's a, that's a good question. So. I would say the assumption is that CREC is able to participate in FCA 14. So what does that assumption mean? That assumption obviously, I think, first and foremost assumes that uh, that CREC is allowed to proceed, um, that you know the ISO determines that they can participate. So that is the assumption part. If that assumption is correct, it is my forecast that Clear River will clear FCA 14. Okay. So the assumption is that they are eligible to participate in FCA 14. And um, with apologies to Mr. Blazer, I just want to make sure that I understand this correctly. I uh, ask you to clarify. You're assuming that Invenergy's two turbines will be qualified to participate in forward capacity auction 14 to be held in February 2020. Is that correct? That's correct. My, my testimony is based on the fact that they would participate and clear that auction. And that's your assumption? My assumption is that they will be able qualified. to participate. Yes. And if your assumption is correct, that Invenergy will be qualified for two turbines, approximately 1,000 megawatts, 
in FCA 14, it is your prediction that both turbines will clear. I, I would use the word forecast, but different terminology that it would clear the auction, yes. Okay. And that's based on the assumption that, it, that both turbines qualify. That's correct. Okay. Going back to your November 20th, 2017 testimony, your, here you use the word assumption, or assume. When you assume, sorry, where are you? I'm sorry, uh, November 20th, yep. 2017, page two, okay. line seven. Okay. You assumed that CREC 2 would participate in FCA 13 right? That's correct. And your assumption in that regard was mistaken. Is that right? And, and my assumption at this time was that it, it would participate in FCA 13. We know today that it will not participate in FCA 13. So this assumption that you made was incorrect. Look at your most recent supplemental testimony, December 14th, 2018. Explain on line 10 your use of an acronym, URA, and you're referring to the Utility Restructuring Act of 1996, is that right? <coughs> That's correct. And on page, uh, on line 17, starting in the middle of the page, you say the PUC explained that the URA has, quote, effectively repealed by implication the much older need assessment provision of the Energy Facility Siting Act. You see that? Yes. And that, I believe, please correct me if I'm wrong, uh, refers or <clears throat> sends us to page 12, starting at line 20. The question starting at line 20 is, who bears the financial burden or risk of building CREC? And what portion of that risk is borne by Rhode Island retail electric customers? You say, simply put, Invenergy, as the developer of CREC, bears the sole financial burden of building CREC. And there's no financial burden borne by Rhode Island ratepayers. Is that right? That's correct. And is that what you were referring to on page five about the effect of the Utility Restructuring Act? In a way, yes. So if, if I can explain, um, you know, prior to the deregulation of the electricity market, utilities um, were responsible for resource planning. So they would determine what power plants were needed to be constructed. And they had to go through a process to essentially prove need among other factors. Um, the reason that that structure is in place is the utility would decide to build a plant. That cost was passed through to ratepayers, irrespective of whether the plant was needed. Once the plant was built, the cost of that was directly passed on to ratepayers. That market construct no longer exists. The market construct that exists today is a competitive market 
where generation um, and and um, you know the retail uh, elements of the electricity market are separate. It's a deregulated market. So the the, the PUC opinions that we've seen in INDAC, um, uh, INDAC and Tiverton and Hope um, took a more liberalized view of need um, that was based on um, a, a competitive market. Because ultimately, and this is this goes back to page 12, the, the, the burden or the risk, you know, if Invenergy builds, were to build this plant and it were to lose money, that does not impact the rate payers, that impacts in better. And that's a different construct than existed prior to deregulation. And in fact, you reference the INDAC and Tiverton Power cases at the top of page nine of this testimony, don't you? That's correct. Well, let's come back to page nine in a moment, because I do have some questions about these cases. But first, staying on page 12, You weren't saying that the Energy Facility Siting Board should ignore the statutory requirement that it find need before it issue a permit for this power plant, were you? Sorry, I missed the word before need. Could you read that depending question, please? find that there is a need for the plant before it issues a permit. Don't, don't answer the question if you don't understand it. I can rephrase it. Okay. Please. Okay. Are you aware of the fact that the Energy Facility Siting Act that created the Energy Facility Siting Board requires that the EFSB find need for a new power plant before it issue a permit? Yes. You are not suggesting by saying that the sole financial burden of building CREC is on the developer. You weren't suggesting that the EFSB should ignore the statutory requirement that it find need before it issue a permit, were you? No, that's, that's not what I was saying. What I was saying is I think that the definition of need um, is clearly stated in the PUC advisory opinions that were referenced in my testimony. And then I think that is an appropriate guideline to assess the need for clear report. Let's take a look at those cases that you reference in your testimony. They appear at the top of page nine. At the bottom of page eight, you say, well, let's be fair to you and look at the whole question and the whole answer for context. The question starts at line 24 on page 8. Does it make sense to tie Creck's need solely to obtaining a CSO, as Mr. Walker claims in his Sir rebuttal testimony, page 5, lines 19 to 20? Your answer, beginning on uh, line 28, you say no. Apart from being extremely short-sighted, that approach would essentially undermine this entire permitting process. And on, page, on line 32, you say, indeed, all previously permitted major energy generation facilities in Rhode Island were granted a license without requiring a CSO. Is that sentence right? That's correct. And you cite, the first case you cite is In Ray Rhode Island Hope Energy Limited Partnership. Is that right? Yes. The EFSB decision was issued May 24th, 1999? That's correct. Isn't it a fact, Mr. Hardy, that on May 24th, 1999, the ISO did not run a forward capacity market? And isn't it a fact that the ISO on May 24th, 1999, 
had never held a forward capacity auction? That's correct. And isn't it correct that on May 24th, 1999, no power plant in New England had ever gotten a capacity supply obligation because they didn't exist yet? Second case is In Re Tiverton Power Associates. You cite that for the proposition. Your sentence is, indeed, all previously permitted major energy generation facilities in Rhode Island were granted a license without requiring a CSO. In Re Tiverton Power Associates was decided by the EFSB March 25th, 1998 at a time when the ISO did not run a forward capacity market, Correct. had never conducted a forward capacity auction, Correct. no resource in New England had ever acquired a capacity supply obligation because they didn't exist yet, right? Well, the, the date of this decision is prior to the previous one. Could you read back the pending question? The answer is yes. Thank you. The next case is in re application of Narragansett Electric Company and New England Power Company. That decision was dated December 17, 1990. Is that correct? That's correct. There was no forward capacity market in 1990, was there? There was not. No forward capacity auctions had been held, had they? No. No resource had acquired a CSO, is that right? The next case you cite is in re application of Ocean State Power. That was a 1988 case, is that right? That's correct. The ISO had not yet come into existence, had it? No, in fact, um, if you move down to the next paragraph, um, I say it's certainly true when previous decisions were rendered, major energy facilities did not have an opportunity to get into an auction to secure a CSO. However, because all other major energy generating facilities have established need without causing CSO during licensing proceedings, ICE New England's recent termination request, request does not mean that CREC is not needed, particularly in the aftermath and adoption of the EOA. I believe that answers the question. You never attended law school, is that correct? That's correct. You don't have a license to practice law in Rhode Island? I do not. You don't have a license to practice law in any other state? I do not. And you're not giving a legal interpretation of the meaning of these cases to the EFSB? I am not giving a legal interpretation. <laughs> Page six of this testimony. Line 17, the question is, you state that one of the factors in your determination of need is that CREC Unit 1 has cleared the FCA, but Unit 1 no longer has a capacity supply obligation, CSO. Does the fact that the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, FERC, granted ISO New England's request to terminate CREC Unit 1's CSO mean that the plant is no longer needed? Is that correct? That's correct. And your answer on line 24 starts, the first two sentences in full say, absolutely not. In fact, quite the opposite. Is that correct? That's correct. This was filed December 14, 2018? That's correct. And when you say quite the opposite, were you suggesting that the involuntary termination of Invenergy's CSO provided evidence that the plant is needed? I believe there are elements of the ISO New England's decision that yes, indeed show that the plant is needed. 
needed because, and, and you were know, talking about this earlier today. Um, because in, in ISO New England's decision, um, their, their decision to terminate uh, the CSO, uh, they make reference to the importance of knowing, uh, having certainty that Clear River will be available as they think about things like transmission planning and like um, the calculation of the ICO. So to me, that, to me that, 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 shows, that shows the importance of the need. So if, if the plan did not matter, and did not need, um, then those wouldn't be important factors that I think were, were evident in, in the ISO's decision, which again, I, I would say, well, we've, we've talked about the fact that they had the decision make there, it was based not on need, but on the fact that the plan was not going to be uh, available on schedule to meet its uh, CSO. So sitting here today, you stand by the answer that starts here on line 23. The next sentence says, as a result of clearing FCA number 10, CREC Unit 1 received a CSO for seven years beginning in June 2019, is that correct? That's correct. And what you meant here was that under Invenergy's original schedule, Invenergy was uh, due to be in commercial operation at the beginning of capacity commitment period 10, June 1st, 2019, is that correct? That's correct. Was Invenergy available starting June 1st, 2019? Uh, they won't be, it doesn't have any and, it, and in fact, Invenergy sold out of its capacity supply obligation for that capacity com commitment period 10 in an earlier annual reconfiguration auction, is that right? Yes, they closed out of that obligation as they were going to be unable to meet it. And uh, Invenergy also sold out of its obligation for capacity commitment period 11 that starts June 1st, 2020. Is that correct? That's correct. And sitting here today, we know that Invenergy won't be ready in 2021. Is that correct? That's correct. And it won't be ready in June 1st, 2022. Is that correct? That is correct. But according to you on lines 24 and 25, Invenergy's clearing FCA 10 and receiving a CSO for the term beginning in June 2019 is evidence that the plant is needed. Yes. Okay. Submitted testimony on need to the Public Utilities Commission in Docket 4609. Is that correct? That's correct. And you submitted multiple uh, sequential testimony in this docket, which has been admitted without objection into evidence. Is that right? Yes. Let's look at page 10. This is the December. Uh, the same. December uh, yes, the December 14. Yep. Okay. Uh, page 10, line 11. The question is, have there been any changes in the market since your previous testimonies that would invalidate the other three principal bases for your opinion that CREC is needed? And your answer on line 15 is no. Is that correct? Yes. And do you stand by that today, that since your previous testimonies have been filed, there have not been any changes in the market that would invalidate your other three principal bases 
for your opinion that crack is needed. That's correct. Okay. The bottom of page 13. Question is line 29 is, has CREC already resulted in significant cost savings for Rhode Island retail electric customers? And your answer at the top of the next page, page 14, is yes. Is that correct? Yes. Now, <clears throat> Invenergy's capacity supply obligation originally was set to begin on June 1st, 2019, right? That's correct. And because Invenergy would not be ready in time, Invenergy sold out of that obligation to another power producer for the period June 1st, 2019 <clears throat> through May 31st, 2020. Is that correct? They, they sold out of their capacity obligation I, I don't know if they sold out to another power producer. I don't think that information is available. They sold out of their capacity supply obligation in an ISO run annual reconfiguration auction. Is that correct? That's correct. And because Invenergy will not be able to be in commercial operation on June 1st, 2020, Invenergy sold out of its CSO in an ISO run annual reconfiguration auction for the period June 1st, 2020 through May 31st, 2021. Is that correct? That's correct. Isn't it a fact, Mr. Hardy, that in the course of those two annual reconfiguration auctions, or ARAs, Invenergy will reap a profit in excess of $26 million because its cost to sell out of that obligation was less than the capacity clearing price back in FCA 10 that Invenergy will be receiving beginning June 2019. So I, I am aware that they closed out of their obligations, and I agree that they closed out of their obligations at a price lower than they received for FCA 10 and 11. I can't verify that number. But in premise, I agree that they closed out of their obligations at a lower price. Okay. That's correct. Okay. And the money, let's say, subject to check, that it's in excess of $26 million for the two ARAs, we'll get that into the record uh, through another witness. Okay. But subject to, to check, that, that amount, 20, in excess of $26 million, will be paid, ultimately, by New England ratepayers. Is that correct? <clears throat> well, I would answer that question by saying, you know, first, their capacity cleared, their capacity cleared FCA 10. That had a meaningful impact on the clearing price for capacity in FCA 10. The volumes associated with the annual reconfiguration option are much smaller. Um, and that, that money um, is, in, in, is part of the overall market cost, but I think is less than the impact that Clear River had by clearing FCA 10, bidding in, and then FCA 11 as a price taker. 
We'll come back in a moment to your statement that the volumes in the ARA are much smaller than in the primary auction. So you're correct about that, but we'll ask about that in a moment. Okay. Meantime, could you please read back the pending question? It's a yes or no question, Ms. Party. for a yes or no answer, but I, I don't I don't I don't think that I would say that that twenty six million dollars is directly paid by ratepayers. I think it's a function of the capacity that is cleared in the annual reconfiguration auction. The ISO runs an energy market <coughs> and it makes payments for energy <laughs> to owners of power plants. And the money that is paid through the ISO to the owners of power plants comes from ratepayers. Is that right? That's correct. And the ISO runs a capacity market in addition to an energy market. Is that correct? That's correct. And the ISO pays money to capacity resources that clear in a forward capacity auction. Is that correct? That's correct. And the money that's paid by the ISO to those resources that clear in an auction comes from ratepayers, doesn't it? That's correct. So the money, the profit that Invenergy made, 26 plus million dollars for capacity commitment periods 10 and 11, June 2019 to May 2021, came from New England ratepayers. Is that correct? The, the price that the capacity cleared in the ARA, the cost of, uh, of the capacity that cleared in the ARA came from ratepayers. I, 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 the, the issue I'm having with a yes or no answer to your question is I, 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 I wouldn't then draw a direct link to say that profit made by Invenergy was paid under the I, I, I wouldn't characterize it in that context. Let's take it another way. On the sheet you have in front of me at your right hand, you agreed with me earlier that the clearing price in the zone that includes Rhode Island in FCA 10 was $7.03 per kilowatt hour. Is that correct? Uh, per kilowatt month. Per, per kilowatt month, yes. Is that correct? That's correct. And um, that is money that Invenergy will receive from the ISO starting June 1st, 2019. Is that correct? That's correct. And, and I would argue that that, that that price that ratepayers will pay, the $7.03, is lower than the price that they would have paid if Clear River did not participate in the market. There isn't a question pending, Mr. Okay. I'd like to move to strike. Uh, the gratuitous remark. To Mr. The seven dollars and three cents per kilowatt month that Invenergy will receive starting June 1st, 2019 from the ISO will ultimately come from ratepayers. Is that correct? That's correct. And Invenergy has sold out of that obligation for both of capacity commitment periods 10 and 11. Is that correct? That's correct. And the amount that Invenergy will pay to somebody else to cover the obligation is enough less than the 703 per kilowatt month that Invenergy will make a profit of over $26 million. Will you accept that subject to check on the amount? Sure. And that profit for Invenergy 
is despite the fact that in 2019, Invenergy will not have a power plant. Is that correct? In 2019, they will not have a plant that's operating. That's correct. And in 2020, they will not have a power plant that is operating. Is that correct? That's correct. And sitting here today, they don't even have a permit for a power plant. Is that correct? No, that's why we're here today. And yet, at the bottom of page 13 and the top of page 14, you say that CREC has already resulted in significant cost savings for Rhode Island electric ratepayers, is that correct? That's correct. And then at the bottom of page 14, line 25, the question is, if built, will CREC continue to provide ratepayer savings? Your answer is yes. And you have a chart on page 16 showing uh, well, the title of your chart is Projected Rhode Island Ratepayer Savings. Is that correct? That's correct. And um, you are, I'm now addressing the capacity side of the savings. From the capacity market, not the energy market. Okay. For the capacity side of those savings, you are assuming that Invenergy will be qualified to participate in FCA 14 and future. Is that correct? That's correct. And you are, I believe your word was forecasting that its two turbines will clear if your assumption about being qualified turns out to be correct. That's correct. Page 17. is what are the key changes between your updated analysis in this third supplemental testimony and that in your January 9, 2018 response to the Division of Planning's data request. <coughs> and your answer is, I have used the exact same modeling process to calculate ratepayer savings, but I've updated the analysis for the latest market information. But as you testified now, your modeling process includes the assumption that Invenergy's two turbines will be qualified to participate in FCA 14, and the forecast that if they are qualified, they will clear. Is that correct? That's correct. On page 19 on line 6, you confirm again that you are uh, basing your cost and ratepayer impact, ratepayer impacts, strike that, let me start again. On page 19 on line 6, when you're talking about ratepayer impacts, you're confirming that you're including the capacity side savings in your estimates. Is that right? That's correct.
Mr. Hardy, I'm going to change subjects here. I'm finished with your uh, pre-filed testimony. I'm going to change subjects here. I'll do this question very slowly. In the entire history of the ISO, has the ISO ever before this case invoked the provisions of tariff provision section 3.13.3.4 Point four C to involuntarily terminate <laughs> the entire CSO of any resource in the ISO system. That's my knowledge. So if somebody said that it happened 66 different times over the years, would that person be mistaken? I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. <laughs> you just testified that to the best of your knowledge, the ISO has never before in its history invoked its tariff provision to involuntarily terminate the entire CSO of a resource. Is that right? You said, yes. to the best of your knowledge, that has never happened in the history of the ISO. Is that correct? That's correct. So if somebody said that that had happened 66 different times in the history of the ISO, would that person be wrong? I don't know. You don't know? Okay. I'm going to change topics again. Um, I have a potential series of questions on a new topic, and you may or may not know anything about this topic. So first, I need to find out if you are able to answer these questions, and if you are, I will proceed, and if you're not, I won't. Are you familiar with the offer price mitigation role of the internal market monitor of the ISO with regard to the day ahead and real-time energy markets? Can, sorry, can you repeat that? Can you repeat that? Are you familiar with the offer price mitigation role of the ISO's internal market monitor with regard to the day ahead and real time energy markets? I'm familiar with those terms, but I'm not sure if I'm if I'm familiar with them enough to answer questions in detail. Okay. Um, you said earlier, and I promise to come back to this, um, and I just made notes of what you said. If I misquote you, please correct me. I'm not trying to put words in your mouth. But I believe you said that uh, the volumes if I got it right, I'll ask you to elaborate. But okay. I believe you said that the volumes in the ARAs, the annual reconfiguration auctions, mm -hmm. are smaller than the uh, quantities that the ISO procures in the primary auction. Do you recall that? I do. 
Um, did I paraphrase you fairly? Yes. Are you saying that Like that. When we refer to the forward capacity auction that the ISO runs in February of every year, once a year, do you understand that to be the primary auction? Yes. And there is a period of time, just over three years, between the time of the primary auction and the beginning of the relevant capacity commitment period. Is that correct? That's correct. And in the primary auction, the ISO, uh, in each auction, procures the net ICR, installed capacity requirement, <coughs> for that future capacity commitment period. Is that correct? At, at a minimum, that's what they procure, yes. Yes. Thank you. And the net ICR figure is filed by the ISO with FERC, and the ISO needs to have FERC approval before it proceeds with that uh, net ICR figure. Is that right? That's correct. And during the period, between the primary auction and the beginning of the capacity commitment period, the ISO runs three annual reconfiguration auctions. Is that correct? That's correct. And those three ARAs are for the same capacity commitment period as the primary auction was. That's correct. And you were saying that the volumes procured by the ISO in those ARAs are lower, smaller. As you get closer to the capacity commitment period, then the amount procured in the primary auction. Is that right? Well, my, my comment is that the volumes in any given ARA annual reconfiguration auction would be much smaller than the volumes or the capacity um, that is cleared in the forward capacity auction. So at a high level, the way that the market structure works is they hold the initial FCA three years in advance to procure at a minimum net ICR. And then each year leading up to that capacity commitment period, they hold an annual reconfiguration auction. And capacity um, can clear that ARA so that can be you know that can be uh, any, any given existing plan that has a CS that has a capacity supply or has obligation if they have the belief that their capacity may be even one megawatt higher or one megawatt lower they could offer to buy or sell that change in megawatts same is true on the load side to the extent that load was a megawatt higher so those annual reconfiguration auctions are um, you know, basically a way to true up what the expectation is for the I'm glad you used the phrase true up. I think you're exactly correct about that. But, but here's what I'd like to do is to clarify, if I'm correct, that you are actually saying two different things, both of which are correct, but are different from each other. Please correct me if I'm wrong. One thing that you're saying, which is correct, is that the number of megawatts traded in each annual reconfiguration auction is much less than the amount, the number of megawatts procured by the ISO in the primary auction. Is that right? And a second thing, which is also correct, but different, is 
the annual reconfiguration auctions are run by the ISO. Is that right? That's right. As are the monthly reconfiguration auctions. Yes. <clears throat> and in the annual reconfiguration auction, one of the things that the ISO does is set a net installed capacity requirement for the relevant capacity commitment period. Is that right? That's correct. Just like it does in the primary auction, right? So the ISO supervises the primary auction, right? That's correct. Supervises the annual reconfiguration auctions that take place after the primary auction, before the relevant associated capacity commitment period. And the ISO sets a net installed capacity requirement for the relevant capacity commitment period in each of those ARAs. And as we get closer to the relevant capacity commitment period, it is the case that the net ICR set by the ISO declines from each auction to the next. Is that correct? I have no further questions. I wonder if we could take five minutes before, before I get started. Sure. If I may, before we start with the issue with Mr. Mackler, I do want to confirm one, one thing with Mr. Elmer. The board may recall that Mr. Elmer, on behalf of CLF, had filed a motion in November to strike Mr. Hardy's air emissions testimony. Uh, and when we argued it on the 75, they even raised it to a constitutional issue. Uh, we made the point that since Mr. Hardy was going to be back today, Mr. Elmer would have the opportunity to, pro to further cross-examine Mr. Hardy on the issues that he was raising regarding air emissions testimony. And Chairperson, you specifically said on December 5, I think that CLF will have an opportunity to cross-examine on the issues that they raised at that time, since Mr. Hardy is already scheduled to testify anyway. Uh, I just want to confirm now, since Mr. Elmer hasn't asked any questions about that subject, that he is, in fact, waiving his opportunity to conduct further cross-exam on the issue of the emissions. No, I'm not waiving anything. I did ask the questions that I wanted to that will provide the foundation for a motion or a renewed motion to strike the air emissions testimony. Um, uh, Mr. Blazer uh, read the record completely correctly and I got the answers that I was looking for. 